Hello and welcome to my channel IELTS Listening. Let's start with one of the best practice tests for improving listening skills. Section 1 First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Making friends with other students sounds special enough. I'd like to emphasise that in the student newspaper. We do try to get our students to be part of the wider university. How do you do that? Do you encourage them to join the sports centre, for instance? Indeed we do. The sports centre is always looking for active participants, particularly in soccer. Oh, and something else. You might like to mention that we don't teach just English here. I mean... We're a language centre, not an English language centre. You may learn Spanish, Mandarin and, and Russian here. And we can sometimes offer other languages. This means we can have some students who are native speakers of those languages as conversation partners for English-speaking students. Who can do those courses? At this time, any native speaker of English. What about the people who are learning English? Can they do a non-English language course? At this time, only if they've almost finished their English language course. You see, we try very hard to involve students who are native speakers of English as conversation leaders, and we encourage our students to join groups on the campus. For instance, if they enjoy music, there's an active jazz group available to everyone, and that's a lot of fun. On the other hand, elementary students can't go to the drama group, their English just isn't ready for that sort of activity. But the university choir welcomes all the singers it can find. They often do large productions that need a lot of voices. I imagine the special conversation groups are open to all your students. I wish they were. I'm sorry to say they're a special service we provide for elementary students only. Is there anything else I can tell you? I'd be really pleased if you could write about the courses we offer in foreign languages. I think our readers would be very interested in that. Thank you for your time, Dr. Robinson. Yes, thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about the centre. It's always good to let the rest of the students at the university know what goes on in our classrooms and outside them. After all, many of our students leave us and then study for degrees in various disciplines on this campus. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Now, let me tell you more about the Student Union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the Union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our Union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. 
Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper, and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example. Perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym. Then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen carefully, and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Do you have any suggestions for prospective students? What bothers me most is handing in essays on time. I almost missed the deadline once because there were three essays due within the same week. So rationalizing your time is critical. Well, that's true. The lectures deliver so much useful information. I have poor memory, so I kept making notes and revisiting them on a regular basis. To my surprise, at the end of the semester, I have learned the key concepts by heart. How was the research? I heard that it was quite challenging. How did you manage to overcome the difficulties? That's true. The majority of us had no clue how to carry out the research at first. Fortunately, when I was digging up reference materials at the library, I sought help from the librarian. She taught me about finding the appropriate resources and choosing the proper research methods. Have you checked out the online forum? Yes, it has become a habit for me to visit the forum regularly. In a sense, it extends classroom learning. It is where the students post academic problems that they come across and get support from the faculty members. Some of my classmates didn't do so well during the placement tests. I feel that background reading is necessary. Lastly. Do you have anything to say to the freshmen? I was really ambitious at first, trying to get straight A's on my transcript. I made tons of notes and worked hard, even on the optional assignments, to get extra credit. I stressed myself out before having an emotional breakdown. After consulting my advisor, I found it important to set realistic goals. Don't push yourself too hard. It is wise to sort out your priorities. Thank you for coming here today and providing valuable feedback on the program. Have a great summer break. Before you hear the rest of the talk, 
You have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce some of our most popular sports facilities here at Northfield Sports Complex. Our 25-meter swimming pool is the centerpiece of the complex, combining modern, bright and airy surroundings with fully up-to-date changing facilities. The pool is excellent for learning how to swim improving techniques and, of course, competing in school competitions. It is also bookable for private functions, including pool parties, where lifeguards are available. Next, we have the only climbing wall throughout the whole town. Many would see rock climbing as a type of extreme sport, exposing great risk to those who participate. But actually, under proper guidance, and with close supervision by the coach here, it is a perfect sport for the youth to increase their flexibility and strengthen their muscles. I have to mention our skating rink once again. As our most popular facility, it has been prominently featured in a TV commercial we've released recently. There is no other skating rink larger than ours within the whole nation. Also, our state-of-the-art gym is an inspiring place to train and keep fit in relaxed and friendly surroundings. The Techno Gym equipment enables our clients to measure their performance. If you book a one-on-one -on -one trainer, he or she might suggest a future training plan and help you train more systematically. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Now, I would like to introduce you to the list of presentations during the following week so that you can better plan your schedule. The first presenter, Simon, is one of our best ski instructors. As an experienced instructor, he will inform you about the dangers that face skiers and snowboarders. Accidents happen mostly to those who are careless or ignorant. Good risk management involves considering both the probability and consequences of an accident. The next speech, titled Solution, is given by Jamie Kurt. A list of problems may occur to novice skiers and snowboarders, so he is going to offer useful information for first-timers on choosing the appropriate gears, the right dress code and ways of protecting your skin. For instance, some of you may have rented the skiing equipment, but rental footwear is notoriously uncomfortable. Then, Jamie will provide instructions to help make your footwear fit better. The third speech is about a documentary introducing skiing and snowboarding and the difference between the two sports. It also depicts a group of snow lovers exploring new slopes with breathtaking views. 
The director, Andy Fisher, will be there addressing the whole shooting experience. The fourth talk is about the tricks of skiing presented by Harry Tyson. It is most useful for those who have already tried skiing yet still need more practice to master the sport. Harry will teach you how to turn more skillfully. A lot of people can keep their skis roughly parallel, but there's no point if you make it hard to work with and slide around out of control. Useful exercises will also be suggested to improve your parallel skiing technique so that you can tackle steeper slopes and enjoy yourself more. Jason Smith will be the last presenter, mainly addressing towards advanced skiers. He manages to apply snow climbing into skiing. Climbing in soft snow, you are floundering around. Walking becomes harder, so a good trick during climbing is to maintain a wider gait, approximately shoulder width, so that you are more stable while walking. This works for skiing as well. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, what I'm going to talk about to you today is something called tea tree oil, which was first extracted from Melaleuca altenifolia in Australia. This species remains the most important commercially. Several other species are cultivated for their oil extraction. There is a very long history of tea tree oil's use in aromatherapy. Traditionally, Melaleuca altenifolia leaves were crushed and the oil was inhaled by the Aborigines of Australia for the treatment of coughs, colds and also for the treatment of wounds. For instance, they chewed the young leaves to alleviate headaches and took them to treat sore throats or skin ailments. The Aborigines world was discovered by Willem Jansson, a Dutch explorer who was the first European to sail to Australia. In 1606, he reached the northern coast of Australia in his ship. Then several voyages of exploration followed in the first half of the 17th century. The Dutch found it a paradise on earth for man's well-being with timber, stone and lime for building. There was also plenty of salt, and the coast was full of fish. Besides, they found the characteristics of the diet there because they happened to meet ten naked black aborigines having a meal in the open air. While the value of tea tree oil originated from Australia, it was gradually known and tested by the outsiders. In the middle of the 18th century, Sir Hugh Palliser, an officer of the British Royal Navy who had been to Australia several times during that period, got serious injuries all over due to his experiences in several wars. For more than the last 15 or 16 years of his life, he seldom laid down in a bed because of the constant pain in his leg. Then he tried tea tree oil, as it was said that tea tree oil could operate as a very powerful immunostimulant for pre- and post-surgical care. The use of the name tea tree, also called paper bark trees, probably originated from Captain James Cook's description he made soon after he had arrived at the coast of New South Wales in 1770. At the time, he witnessed some aborigines of Australia using one of the shrub's leaves to make an infused drink in place of tea. In the 1920s, some human clinical research and the documentation of many benefits associated with tea tree oil were credited, which were made by Dr. Arthur Penfold, an Australian government chemist. He investigated the business potential of a number of native extracted oils, then reported that tea tree oil was promising as it exhibited powerful antiseptic properties. But after World War II, the entry of antibiotics declined the use of natural products in medicine, which had a negative effect on the production of tea tree oil. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turn to section 4. Section 4 First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Right. Now, let me bring you up to date with arrangements for our cycling tour next month. First of all, about the tents. You know at the beginning, the idea was that I arranged to borrow some tents from the college, but it turns out they will be used by the hiking club at the same time, so I'm afraid you will have to bring your own. So. Do remember to tell me whether you prefer to use a single tent or share with others. In this case, I'll know how many tents there'll be when I make the reservation at the various campsites. Last time, some of you said you would like to hire bikes and pick them up when you arrive, instead of taking your own. Well, I've asked lots of shops or agencies about bike hiring in St Andrews, the town where we'll be arriving, and unfortunately there aren't any shops that offer this service, so which, I'm afraid, means taking your own. I'll book them on the train when I book the train tickets, which reminds me, I'll need to know the exact number of people going too, so that I can get a group discount on the train fare. Another one that'll need to be booked is tickets for the football match we discussed last time. I've inquired about availability, and there are only a few seats left, so anyone who wants to go will need to get tickets very soon, ideally today or tomorrow. At our next meeting, I'll be able to give you all individual packs with the final program and something about the area we'll be cycling through and places we'll be visiting. I'm afraid I haven't had the time to do that yet. Now, I'll tell you briefly about some of the attractions in the places we'll be staying. As I said, we'll be taking the train to St Andrews, where there are one or two very good restaurants. One thing that's definitely worth visiting there is the sites where the original town was constructed nearly 1,000 years ago. There's not much of the original buildings left, but there's still plenty to see. The site is being excavated, and you'll be able to help out if you want to. Our next overnight stop will be in the village of Cluny. There are a number of ancient barns here that have been modernised into a museum, indicating the significance of sheep in the area over the centuries. The wool used to be sold for cloth, and it brought riches to the district. There are also several photos describing how agricultural workers lived. From there, we'll leave for Penally. Penally is well known for its museum of village life, but that's being refurbished at the moment, and isn't likely to reopen by the time we go there. But there is an open-air farmer's market every day, selling fruits, vegetables, cheese and meat, all grown or processed within a few miles of the town, and sold by the farmers themselves. It's definitely worth a visit. In Varlo, which is one of the oldest towns in the region, there's a museum that shows how horses used to be the most universal way of travelling around, and how they were gradually substituted by steam, and later, of course, Electric trains, buses, cars and bicycles. Right, now I'll pass around this sheet of paper. That is the end of section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Dear viewers, thank you for taking this listening test. Please let me know about your score in the comments section below. Keep on practicing. It's the only way to be successful. We are planning to upload more IELTS helpful videos. Please subscribe to our channel, IELTS Listening. Thank you.